il non plus ultra del, del, del football. Ha insegnato il calcio in Italia, non, non posso, forse il padre sì, del, del calcio italiano, d'accordo. Ma... Kilpin must have made a huge decision. I will make that move, I will move from my hometown of Nottingham and I will go to Italy and find a new life. Si è realizzato veramente il sogno che avevo da bambino e uno dei giorni più belli della mia vita è, è stata quando ho indossato la maglia, la maglia rossonera. La bella sensazione del soul di uh, Kilpin e poi il Simira in Buonia. Lo devo ringraziare perché avendo diciamo così, costruito il Milan eh, ha dato la possibilità a tutti noi ragazzi di indossare la maglia del Milan e di fare la storia. When Kilpin was born in Victorian times, Nottingham was an expanding town. It was industrializing very rapidly with hosiery and lace especially. The Enclosure Act created a new Nottingham and one of the great things it achieved was creating public parks and open spaces. And this was almost a network, a ring around Nottingham of open spaces, including the Arboretum and the Forest. The Forest had been an open space, but by the Enclosure Act it was designated a place of public recreation. So now all the young people around the area uh, could suddenly go onto this area, the recreation ground of the Forest just over from here at St Andrew's Church and enjoy playing cricket or football. And we know that Kilpin loved this football and lots of other lads in the area love football. Herbert was born on 191 Mansfield Road, just up the hill towards the forest recreation ground, to Edward and Sarah Kilpin. Edward was a butcher and he had his shop at the, the family residence on Mansfield Road. He grew up with numerous brothers and sisters. He was one of 15 children. Um, we don't know much about his early life. Um, I've been able to find his birth certificate confirming when he was born. We don't know where he went to school. Possibly he went to the Bluecoat School, which was just down the road from um, Edward's shop. Um, but we do know that he went to work in the lace market in the Thomas Adams building, probably around 1883, 84, when he left school. By Kilpin's day, the lace industry had become global. It was worldwide. Thousands of men and women were engaged in the trade. And its warehouses and showrooms and finishing rooms were concentrated in the lace market. Just a few streets right in the middle of Nottingham. The lace trade employed thousands of, of people, particularly women, but also many, many men. And there was a diverse range of trades that were needed and skills. Now, there were unskilled workers uh, who would be working in warehouses and there were very skilled designers and, and finishers. Somebody like Kilpin, it could have been quite a struggle to get a job at a lace firm in the lace market. I think he must have been very, very able and hard-working uh, to be able to get a job 
in one of those firms. It wouldn't have been, been easy. Adams and Page was one of the leading lace manufacturers in Nottingham. The building, beautiful building built on Stony Street right in the heart of the lace market, was built in the 1850s by Thomas Adams. He engaged Thomas Chambers Hine, one of the greatest architects of Nottingham, to build his showpiece, his, his great building, his great edifice that included a chapel for the employees. It included showrooms, finishing rooms on five stories. This was going to catch the eye. You were going to turn down that street and say, wow, look, it's a Thomas Adams and Page building. He would have started at the age of 13 or 14 upon leaving school um, as a runner. So he would have picked up the lace um, from the, the courtyard of the warehouse that had been produced outside of the, of the finishing building. And he would have literally brought it up three, four stories through the spiral staircase to the top floor where the lace was finished. It was finished on the top floor because of the, of the light that came in through the skylights. The, the only historical example we have of Herbert playing football in England was his own anecdote from um, his time as a 13-year-old boy playing in a team called the Garibaldi Reds on the Forest Recreation Ground when they won the tournament. That was in 1883. Here at St Andrew's Church, only a stone's throw from the forest, from that recreation ground, they formed a youth team, a church team, of which Kilpin was a member. So this church was very important in terms of youth development of sport and it was also where the first Nottingham Boys Brigade was founded. So I think St Andrews was very special and it was just up the road from where Kilpin was born and lived in those early days. So he played for St Andrews which was the local church side and then for Knotts Olympic which was um, an amateur side of the times, which also played in red and black. Lace was worldwide. It had connections right from the very early days with the whole of Europe, South America. But it was especially in Europe that there were links. In Italy, in Spain, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, France. They were all producing their own lace and other textiles and they were all trading with Nottingham. So of course there were buyers of lace who would come over from countries including Italy who would come to firms like Thomas Adams and Louis Heyman and Birkin in the lace market. They also would go up those grand steps into Adams and they would look round at the showrooms at all the different designs and say, hmm, I'll have one of that and one of that and one of that. Um, and who have you got working with you at the moment? Hmm. And of course, one of those buyers was Eduardo Bossio, who came from Italy. And he may have just got chatting to Herbert Kilpin, said, hmm, don't suppose you fancy coming to Italy, do you, young man? And he may have said, hmm, yeah, hmm. Bossio may have said, don't suppose you like uh, football, do you? Oh, I play a bit of football, played in a youth team at St Andrews. And of course, I think they are bonded both over lace and over football. And at some point, it's very likely that Bossio would have said to Kilpin, what about coming to Italy? I'll sort it out, find you somewhere to live. And football's just setting off there. Get a place perhaps in uh, Turin or Milan. And I guess... Kilpin must have made a huge decision. I will make that move. I will move from my hometown of Nottingham and I will go to Italy and find a new life.
Italy was going through an industrial revolution. That's why it was attracting people from outside. The first factories were opening, be a place like Pirelli and Campari. Um, football would have been trying to find other people who wanted to play, teaching them a new game or finding people who already played, which is probably English people. So it was probably part of an identity, of a group identity that, that was around at the time. So we were talking about something that's more or less unknown in Italy. No one really knows the rules, it hasn't got any fans, it hasn't got a tournament or a championship, there aren't any clubs. So it's a kind of prehistoric age of football, um, which is brought into Italy by, mostly by English travellers and businessmen, people travelling back and forth between England and Italy. What we know about Kilpin's life in Turin is that he arrived in the summer of 1891. There were already some English men there, in particular Tom Savage, who went on to find fame as the, uh, the bearer of the Notts County strip to Juventus a couple of years later. We know that he was there first and introduced Herbert to football in Italy because the year before he died, Herbert spoke about his first game of football, which was in a vast open square in Turin, where he was invited to play for the English against the Italians. And it was a completely disorganised game of football, more akin to rugby, where more and more Italians kept joining the game. So eventually there were double the number of Italians playing against the English, even though the English still won 5-0. So that was quite an interesting anecdote to give you an idea of the, the, the different levels of football and the quality of football in England and in Italy. So when we talk about football in, the, in Italy in the 1890s, early 20th century, we've got a kind of prehistoric phase, I think, is a, is a good way of thinking about it. The rules are different, there's no, the offside is very different. There's a lot of rushing around, I think, after the ball. Plus you've got to think that there aren't really any tactics uh, in any kind of sense that we understand. There's not really any training in any sense that we understand. There aren't really any managers. And so it's, it's really a very different game. It's almost not really, it's kind of like going to a park and watching some kids run around, okay? They're not kids. They're probably pot-bellied men, but that's what it would be like at that time. So he arrived in, in 1891, probably speaking no Italian whatsoever. So there would have been a time of acclimatization to the language, to the culture, to the food. We know that he stayed in Turin for about six or seven years. He played for one of the first football teams in Italy, which was called Internazionale. But the problem was they didn't have many teams to play against. Um, football developed in Genoa around 1894. There started to be games between the teams in Genoa and Turin around 1896, 1897. I think Kilpin is one of those pioneers um, who takes the game into Italy. And they think, and they've got to the level where we can actually start forming teams, structuring the having a championship across a few cities in Italy. So they're really people who are starting from something from nothing. Uh, they're inventing rules, they're inventing regulations, they're inventing federations from nothing. And it's like this already happened in England decades before. So he's kind of copying what's gone in England, but he's also adapting it to Italian society. And most of the early football clubs in Italy are football and cricket clubs. So they were going to play football in the winter and cricket in the summer. The cricket never really took off. It was only the football that took off. We know that Herbert moved to Milan in around 1897, again for work, for the same reasons that had brought him to Turin. So he started seriously to look into founding his own football team in the city. They all tended to congregate at that time at the Trotters Field, which is very, very close to where Milan Central Station is now. It was a place where horse races took place and where a lot of the, the expats came to have a, have a kick around of football. It was also a place where a lot of Italian students gathered. So around that time, he was building up a constituency of support for a new football club. So he had his expat friends, uh, who he met in the bars after work, uh, there were the Italian students. And he also um, found out about the, the vice consul of, uh, the, the British vice consul of Milan called um, Alfred Edwards, who uh, was a cricket man, not a football man. But he somehow convinced Edwards to become the president of his new football team. So with this guy's patronage, he was able to tap into uh, a network of influence and power within Milan. And the, uh, the Pirelli brothers, who were the sons of the founder of the very famous uh, Pirelli rubber company in Italy, were uh, co-founders of the Milan Football Club, 
which was uh, formally convened for the first time at what was the Hotel uh, du Grand et des Anglais, uh, very close to the railway station. It's now called uh, Il Principe di Savoia, the Prince of Savoy Hotel, which is probably the most exclusive hotel in the whole of Milan and was a fitting backdrop for Herbert to, to gather all um, his supporters and acolytes to launch uh, the Milan Football and Cricket Club on the evening of the 16th of December, 1899. Well, AC Milan is really very much linked to the Principe di Savoia because uh, Herbert Kip, um, Kilping really uh, started here, founded here the AC Milan. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the very beginning, it was the uh, football and cricket club, really, no? But then it turned into football only because cricket wasn't really very successful in Milan. So we are very much uh, thankful to, to Herbert um, Kilping because, again, he founded AC Milan here with Mr. Uh, Pirelli, with Mr. Pirelli and many other um, businessmen, students and uh, English workers that were working in Milan. Before the assembled gathering on that dark night in December 1899, Kilpin lifted for the first time the black and red stripes of what would become AC Milan. He said to everybody present, our colours will be red because we will be the devils, and black because of the fear we will strike into the hearts of our opponents. one of the most famous clubs in the world, AC Milan, for what they've achieved. So for me, it was, it was a great honor and something I look forward to immensely. And I talk about it fondly with people even now, my time in Italy, you know, putting that shirt on and going out in front of, you know, almost 100,000 people regularly to play football. is just an amazing, amazing part of my life. I am very grateful because it was realized the dream that I had as a child. E uno dei giorni più belli della mia vita è, è stata quando ho indossato la maglia, la maglia rossonera. Beh, pochi giocatori possono, possono dire ho fatto una doppietta in finale di Champions League. Eh, il 94 secondo me è stato forse la ciliegina su una carriera fortunatamente lunga e piena di successi, soprattutto negli ultimi dieci anni di Milan, essere al posto giusto, al momento, al momento giusto, essere sempre in grado di, di mettersi a disposizione della squadra e soprattutto di fare della qualità e non della quantità la mia, la mia, la mia presenza. Eh, gol importanti in quella stagione come il, il 2-1 sul, sull'Inter che abbiamo vinto lo Scudetto, i due gol della finale di Champions League e la chiamata in, in nazionale a, a USA 94. Penso che ecco, quei due gol ovviamente rimarranno sempre nella storia perché da qui fino a che ci sarà il calcio quando li faranno vedere le, le, le immagini delle finali di Champions League ci sarò anch'io. Io e il capitano Franco Baresi siamo andati sulla sua tomba eh, un, po di tempo, un po' di tempo fa, forse non so quanti sanno che è sepolto a Milano. Ho letto la sua storia che giocava gratis, eh, era molto attento eh, con, con i ragazzi, li faceva, li faceva divertire, non ha mai voluto essere pagato ed è strano che sia stato fondatore, giocatore, allenatore e anche manager della, della sua squadra. Devo ringraziare perché avendo diciamo così, costruito il Milan eh, ha dato la possibilità a tutti noi ragazzi di indossare la maglia del Milan e di fare la storia. E la storia c'era già ma noi l'abbiamo fatta attraverso il campo e, ed è stata una cosa molto bella. Dunque il, i colori rossoneri sono colori tradizionali, belli e per uno come me 
che ha fatto il settore giovanile, che è cresciuto in questo, in questo ambiente qua, il, diciamo così, te la metti sulla pelle che non si toglie più. today for me because I am the speaker of AC Mila in the stadium. Now I am the voice of the team. It, uh, today I meet the, 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 the person who, who make this dream. Incontrare la storia del nostro fondatore, che non è soltanto il fondatore di una squadra di calcio, ma è un, un, una persona, una persona come noi, una persona non dell'alta borghesia, non dell'aristocrazia, ma una persona, un human, che grazie a passione e tenacia e determinazione è riuscito a far diventare un suo sogno il nostro sogno. Eh, Herbert Kilpir è il nostro fondatore. Ogni visitatore che viene a casa Mila raccontiamo la sua storia eh, perché già dall'origine del nome si capisce che il nostro club è intimamente legato al, al suo fondatore. La parola Milan in inglese è un'anomalia nella storia del calcio italiano, un nome inglese per una squadra italiana, ma ci serve subito a marcare una differenza eh, che in origine è stata molto importante. Quando il calcio ancora in Italia era praticato secondo determinate regole non condivise da eh, il calcio internazionale, eh, Kilpin è stato anche un formatore, un educatore, è riuscito a trasmettere una grande passione e anche un modo di giocare al calcio che non era soltanto delle regole ma anche un modo di rispettare e di vivere il calcio intensamente eh, in, una, in una logica anche, dico io, etica no? che magari poi è andata perdendosi ma in origine ha fatto in modo che appunto eh, dei valori che quello che Robert nel suo romanzo ha chiamato il Lord del, del Milan venissero trasmessi immediatamente a, a, ai supporter, a, agli abitanti della città di Milano e poi anche ai giocatori. How would you define AC Milan? One of the biggest clubs in the world, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, a global brand to uh, supporters that, you know, legendary supporters, uh, and a club that has been there and done it. You know, they had a period of uh, European Cup wins, um, they had a period through the 90s that they, you know, were a, f a force of nature. Um, and uh, I think it, within the game of football globally, they will always be a massive club and a massive pull for any sort of player to, to uh, you know, who would want to play for a football club. I was born in Derby and brought up in Nottingham. My dad was playing in, in Nottingham uh, at the period of, of, of my growing up years anyway. It's where the game of football started for me. Um, I think my first introduction uh, to the football game as a, as, a, as a bigger game, I think. South Knotts was, you know, probably my first big step up the ladder. A very influential period, without a shadow of a doubt, and, and, and always had far, fond memories of, of, of Nottingham. down you go down under in, in the tunnel which is underground and then you come up up onto the steps and there is a, an incredible sight of 92,000 people you know predominantly AC Milan supporters because it's our home game and you could actually literally you've heard this saying a thousand times you could actually cut the atmosphere with a knife the electricity in the air was incredible the hairs on my arms and back of the neck they were at all You know, I'd never ever sampled anything like this in my life. Fortunately for me, that sort of washed off pretty quickly and got myself into game mode. They scored, we scored, 1-1. And then that moment came. Um, you know, it was a ball out into a, a right wing area. Pietro Paolo Verdis uh, picked the ball up. I think uh, one look up, one look down, and I knew the ball was gonna, gonna be whipped in. Um, it was in, a, in the area 
I saw it from a long way. I had a good run at the centre half and I had an enormous leap at the end of it. I couldn't have headed the ball any better. Uh, and the timing was spot on. I, you know, I literally got up half a second before Colavarti, who then helped me to get up even higher. After, after that occasion, then every, everything is, is crazy. The red and black half of, of Milan parted for a, a while. Uh, must be said, uh, and then my whole life changed. Um, it was an in incredible, I would say, month, six weeks after that, everything you know came to be, if you want to uh, put it that way. There's something about red and black stripes when when you put it on. For one thing, stripes always make you make you appear taller. For one thing, when when you do that, um, and then it's I think it's in a very exciting strip as well. And you know, with things behind it, you know. Um, that I found out was, uh, you know, the reason why they went for the two colours, you know, red for the devil, because I think we all need a bit of devil. If you're going to be successful, you need to have a bit of that about you. And then, you know, the black strikes fear into the opposition's hearts, which is really ideal because, you know, you want to always you want to frighten the opposition to make life difficult for them. And if you can do that, um, I think it gives you definitely a, a step forward. So that's, that strip is always very special to me. And um, I've actually, at the clubs I've been to back in England, I... Uh, I got Watford to wear black and red stripes <laughs> as a second strip. I did it at Bournemouth as well. I got them to wear, um, like Derry wore black and red stripes also. So um, since AC Milan days, of, you know, I've sort of encouraged that and celeb football team that I played in, I made sure they wore red and black stripes as well. So, you know, always kept that going because that's something that will always be close to my heart. Ma eh, io dico così che il club del Milan è un club in cui un ragazzo che entra come me. E ti entra nella pelle e non la dimentichi più e dunque poi io sono stato anche fortunato di avere giocato in un momento in cui la squadra era forte, si vinceva ma credo che l'organizzazione Milan sia un esempio veramente dal punto di vista calcistico Kilpin was very important obviously in founding this club which has this long history and of, of achievement and a very very big fan base for a long time he was forgotten. Uh, we don't know directly why this was the case. He wasn't talked about, the fans didn't talk about him, there weren't any clubs named after him. Um, and I think this is to do with fascism. Fascism wanted to make out that football was Italian, not English. They, changed the, they forced the clubs to change their names to Italian names. The Internazionale became Ambrosiana, Milan became Milano. They forced them to do that. And so you couldn't talk about the English people involved. And then it was only very recently in the 90s when some passionate fans have gone to look at these stories that they found out again about Kilpin. They found his grave. They've brought back the memory. And the fans themselves have kind of attached themselves to that memory with big banners and so on about Kilpin. So he went away and he came back again. I first heard about Herbert Kilpin on the 9th of June 2007 which was when I bought a copy of the Nottingham Evening Post. On the headline for the paper was um, Local Lad Founds European Giants. And I was intrigued and I, I wanted to know more. So I, uh, that's how I first found out about Kilpin. So in terms of trying to research the story, I started research as soon as I read the article on Kilpin in 2007. And then for the next few years, I've spent a lot of time, or I spent a lot of time, on the internet, looking at fans' websites, looking at, initially at the Wikipedia entry for, for, for Kilpin, and then getting in touch with probably the most important figure in the modern day story of Kilpin, who's Luigi La Rocca in Italy, who discovered Kilpin for his club back in 1998. So with Luigi's help and all the archive material he gave me, I had something to go on. Still not a huge amount of information, so partway through writing the book, I realised I didn't have enough to write a straight biography of, of Kilpin. So I decided to write a novel based upon his life. So Luigi La Rocca is one of these fans who really wants to know everything about about his team and has kind of made that that extraordinary search for Kilpin's roots. He found the grave that had been lost. He um, he made a big campaign to have Kilpin rehabilitated and and reburied and so on. So there's this you know he had a very deep relationship with this club, almost as if it was his relative or something like that. And I think there are lots of fans in Italy have that relationship, a very emotional relationship with with their club. Uh, 
I became uh, AC Milan supporter uh, when I was young, I have uh, uh, 50 years, because my uncle showed me uh, the final between uh, AC Milan and Benfica played in 63 uh, at the Wembley Empire Stadium. And uh, this is the, the first time that I, uh, I became an AC Milan supporter. Kilpin uh, is uh, the father of uh, AC Milan and probably the father of uh, Italian football, uh, played with uh, British rules. He is the founder of uh, an idea. He, uh, he was a teacher the teacher of football in Italy. La mia famiglia era tepidamente milanista. Avevo però, prima della guerra, uno zio molto milanista. E, e nella mia casa prima della seconda guerra mondiale si radunavano un po' tutti i giovani del Mila, milanisti dell'epoca quindi c'era un po' questa tradizione che io ho, così, ho raccolto poi un bel giorno mh, ricordo che il papà eh, di un mio amico, di, uh, mio compagno di scuola elementare mi aveva regalato un distintivo del Milan io subito me lo sono messo sulla mia gia giacca, e ero un bambino di nove anni e da quel momento lì sono diventato non un milanista, un grande milanista. Abitavo proprio vicino all'autostrada dove i calciatori, parecchi calciatori del Milan, attendevano il pullman per andare a, a Milanello agli allenamenti quindi sin da bambino io ho delle foto da ragazzino 10 12 13 anni insieme ai giocatori proprio perché amavo il Milan addirittura non so qua se si usava una volta non avendo denaro io abitavo abbastanza vicino abitavo un paio di chilometri da San Siro e non avendo denaro andavo a piedi chiaramente e anziché pagare il biglietto si dice da noi si scavalcava la cinta questa cinta, a pensarci adesso, è pericolosissima era, perché aveva dei pugilioni alti così. Qualcuno ogni tanto rimaneva così, ma anche con la carne, cioè si fa, parecchia gente si è fatta male. Attualmente eh, non spendo tanto tempo per questa, questo piccolo museo. Vengo qui una volta alla settimana un'ora e mezza, due ore, più che altro il lunedì dopo la partita, per cui metto via la gazzetta, aggiorno le statistiche de delle quali sono particolarmente geloso perché le statistiche alla rivista del Milan le ho fornite io, anche quelle che poi dopo sono finite al Museo del Milan di Casa Milan, e per cui non è che de 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 adesso che qui Ogni tanto mia moglie è così carina che viene qui che mi pulisce un po', io non voglio che tocchi più che le cose perché se mi tocca poi magari mi mette fuori posto qualcosa. Beh, io credo che la rocca ha molta roba. Io mi occupo più, come vi ho detto, delle statistiche. Lui ha molto eh, oggettistica anche, fotografie. Devo dire che io sono più domestico come collezionista, mi piace stare tra le mura della, di casa, lui è un, ha una capacità di andare a cercare le cose eh, che io non ho, perché un po' mi vergogno di andare dai, dai vecchi giocatori a chiedere, lui invece ha una capacità veramente notevole, quindi a parte la rocca, di cose così, eh, di collezionisti così, non credo. 
mio sogno da bimbo era diventare calciatore, purtroppo la statura non me lo permette e quindi eh, ho riversato tutta la mia passione nella filatelia, nella filatelia specializzazione calcio. Mi ricordo quando, quando anni fa ho iniziato a fare una collezione di filatelia e memorabilia dedicato a, al Milan, incominciai a studiare molto più seriamente quello che era. Milano. e beh, dal di lì che ho cominciato a conoscere Kilping, a leggere un pochettino la storia. Io essendo amico di La Rocca ci vedevamo tutti i giorni, ne parlavamo e lui mi, mi, mi raccontava eccetera, quindi mi ha eliminato molte letture eh, perché non sono uno che legge tanto. E, e quindi per me Kilping è stato una, una... sì sapevo che era stato fondato dagli inglesi ma non in, con questo dettaglio, no? e quindi per me è stata una scoperta, ma parlo di anni fa chiaramente, poi con Luigi mi sono preso questa malattia per Kirby, queste cose, ho voluto fortemente da anni, da anni, presso il Milan per fare un annullo, un ricordo filatelico, un qualcosa di Kirby perché ha insegnato il calcio in Italia, non, non posso, forse il padre sì, del, del calcio italiano, d'accordo, ma non si può non ricordare, finalmente siamo riusciti a fare l'annullo, per me è una soddisfazione enorme, anche perché io mi diverto a disegnare gli annulli. Questo è uno, è uno, è uno di quelli che ho disegnato, così mi tengo di ricordo. Finalmente c'è Kipi. C'è una stampa speciale per l'anniversario di Kipi, le italiane poste, fanno questo speciale. E questo è il postcard originale per la commemorazione di Herbert Kilpin. E ora diamo una stampa al postcard e faccio un piccolo importante pezzo di collezione. So Luigi's story started in around 1979 when Milan won their 10th Scudetto or Championship which entitled them to, to put the star onto their shirt. And even though this was 20 years before the centenary of his club, he decided then to try to find some biographical information about every single player who had played a minute of a game for his beloved club. So in the age before the internet, he starts scouring telephone directories, archives, picking up the phone to old players, to their family, just to try to find out something about every player who played for Milan. And he comes across... Um, a, a record in an archive of Kilpin in 1998 which uh, records the burial of somebody called Alberto Kilpin because this was a mistake no one had heard of Herbert in uh, in Italy at that time it wasn't a, it wasn't an Italian name and he found Kilpin's remains in 1998 in the Muzocco cemetery he told the club and with their help he arranged for Kilpin's bones which he carried in his hands in a casket to be buried in a vault, a fairly modest vault in the monumental cemetery of Milan which is uh, the, the resting place of the great and good. Oggi il centenario del fondatore tu che sei pianista di Robin Hood del Nero. Qui c'era la fiscalia Toscana, prima sei da me. Hai capito? Ho capito, grazie. Bene, forza mia. Sì, forza mia. Giusto che voi sappiate che oggi il fondatore del Nero. Saturday, the 22nd of October, 2016, 100 years to the day that Herbert Kilpin died. This behind me is the monumental cemetery of Milan where Herbert is buried. He's buried in that wing over there in a vault. That over there is called the Famedio, which is the Hall of Fame, where either famous people are buried or their names are recorded on a plaque on the wall. Thank you. 
1998, Luigi La Rocca scoured all the cemeteries of Milan to try to find the last remains of Herbert Kilpin. He found them and arranged for the club to have them brought here, put in the wing there in a small vault. But Luigi wasn't happy with that. And he then wrote to the council for about three, four years, pestered them to get them to introduce Herbert into the Hall of Fame. And finally, in November 2010, before Franco Baresi and all the rich dignitaries and powerful people of Milan, Herbert's name finally went on to the big plaque in the Hall of Fame. Most recently, today, we actually see the name of Cesare Maldini, the father of Paolo, being inscribed into the marble plaque. So Herbert is in very, very good company. We've been in and we've been to the tomb and we've also spoken with many of the um, AC Milan fans who have come to pay their respect today. There were a number of obituaries which came out around the time of his death which proclaimed him to be a pioneer or a father of Italian football but also mentioned that in the months leading to his death he'd gradually disappeared from the footballing scene because after he stopped playing he was Milan's greatest fan so he was always seen on the touchlines. He came along in his heavy brown coat with his hands in his pockets and his hat over his, his eyes and he used to watch the games very very quietly, he used to acknowledge people who came up to him. Kilpin died in October 1916, a couple of months after the Battle of the Somme. I think his, his decline in health must have been fairly rapid because we know that he played veterans football until the age of 43, but he was dead by the age of 46. He's the father of everybody, uh, Herbert Gilpin. So uh, we have to celebrate, I think, to win uh, this night. Siamo stati la scorsa settimana a Nottingham in, uh, in memoria di Kilpin perché oggi proprio c'è il centenario della sua morte. Siamo andati a vedere la via dove è nato in centro a Nottingham. Allora, raga, forza Milan, tu sei tutta la mia vita, Herbert Kilpin, grande fondatore. Signore e signori, presento a voi il nostro fondatore, Herbert Kilby! Time and the match has finished. Believe it or not, Milan have won 1 0. Juventus have won the league for the last five seasons, and Milan were the real underdogs. But obviously, on today, Herbert Kilpin's centenary, they came up with the goods with a bit of help from Herbert up there.
Liviamo, liviamo nei lieti carici che la velletta infiora e la fuggevole, fuggevole ora ci devi abbolutta. Liviamo nei dolci fremiti che suscita l'amore poiché quell'occhio è cuore This was his parents' room. So this is where Italian football began. When yeah. he was born in this room. Okay. okay. Very happy. We know the the born of a legend. Yeah. Birth of a legend here. Born yeah. of a legend. A beautiful sensation. The soul of uh, Kilpin and then AC Milan born here. Posso solo dire che qui ci sono le radici del Milan. Le radici, veramente. Questa piccola stanzetta, così, eh, beh, adesso disadorna e anche eh, così malmessa, non la dimenticherò mai. I was got involved about five months ago when I read uh, an article on Herbert Kilpin after researching some information on John Savage and two days into my research on John, John uh, Herbert's name kept popping up. So my wife said, well, I'll try and find some information for you. So we, we looked and there was nothing. Um, so we, we approached Nottingham City of Football to see if they could get a contact who would, who, would like to, who would make a plaque and put it onto the building. And it was them that put us in contact with Robert, who'd already done some research and all those years research for his book. Because at the time we didn't know who the landlords were, so to mark the occasion of Herbert passing away 100 years ago, we approached Nottingham City Transport to see if they would name a bus after Herbert, which they agreed within about six hours. Uh, and also Nottingham City Council agreed to rename the bus shelter outside. So the sheriff in Nottingham agreed to unveil both for us in the presence of one of Herbert Kilpin's uh, family members and other dignitaries from Nottingham. First of all, I'm a Notts County fan, and then a football fan, I suppose. But I, I like to promote the city in any way which I can, and, and Herbert is, would be a great ambassador for little boys, little girls who, who probably never think about doing anything with football in their lives. And it's just a perfect story if, if you well, read Robert's book. For me, watching their reactions is, I suppose I feel it a little in a little way, but for those guys who's been all, all, part, all their lives, uh, to be here, I, I, it must be totally amazing for them. It, it must be, seeing their reactions, their faces. It's just, so, it's, it's a shame that it's a bit in this state, but at least the new owners are going to uh, make it all decent again. to the forest recreation ground where Herbert first played football and the gentlemen or now the lads because they're getting younger with every day have been kicking a ball around then we've been um, to the the end of the pilgrimage uh, Herbert Kilpin's birthplace the new owners kindly let us in 
So we've had a walk round. We've been in the room where Kilpin was probably born, and uh, the three gentlemen became very emotional about that. And now we are on the Kilpin bus. So this picked us up from the Kilpin house outside the Kilpin bus stop, and the Kilpin bus is bringing us to the Kilpin pub for a nice meal uh, before we then uh, proceed to the football grounds. We really wanted to sort of find a name that was strong and, and would give it a, a real identity. And when we found out the story about the Herbert Kilpin, about Herbert Kilpin and his journey and his forming of AC Milan, we just couldn't believe it that hardly anyone knew the story. We, I certainly didn't, and I'm a huge football fan. And when we saw pictures of Herbert Kilpin and we started researching about him and chatting with Robert, we found out that he was a bit of a lad. You know, he liked to drink. He's, um, he, when he played in goal, he had a little bottle of whiskey tucked in behind the, the goal post. So that made us feel that idea, that, that human side to it, that he, he was a bit of a lad. And I think we wanted to honour that. I think the fact that he, most of the people that come into a pub probably <laughs> like a drink and like sport. And so it, it really ties in nicely. Uh, Marzo. 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 Marzo.
he had a great generosity towards others in terms of the time that he gave teaching um, Italians how to play football. After he'd finished playing, he played for veterans, but he also taught the, uh, the young boys how to play football. A lot of fans, hardcore fans especially, are dissatisfied with what they call modern football. The role of TV, the increasing prices, the marketization of football. And I think that has the rea- one of the reactions to that is to look back at your history of your club. Your club has a long history, humble origins. And I think that's part of the reaction to what's called modern football is to go back to people like Kilpin and say, look, we've got origins, we've got identity. We're not just a marketing tool for Chinese internet. And I think that's partly what's going on here with this rediscovery of, of the past. I think with the Herbert Kilpin story, especially for the... The, the Milan fans is that they they're looking at something from their heritage, from their history and they, they love the idea that this is a very simple, humble beginnings and I think Italians, they love the theatre and drama of football but they also love the, the history and I think that's very true with the ultras and very true with their, the way that they have custodians um, the fans see themselves as custodians of their club and they're very passionate about that and I think the Herbert Kilpin story is one that will always ring true for them because it, it gives them an identity probably above their international brothers and probably above the other clubs in the league. We don't know the reasons for his death. We can suppose it may have been cirrhosis of the liver or lung cancer from his drinking and smoking. But I get the impression it was a, a fairly lonely death because at the time Milan was being bombed by Austrian aeroplanes. This was the first time uh, there'd been aeroplanes which had been used in warfare so Milan to some extent was in rubble people were out on the front fighting in the Alps and in the Carso which is on the eastern Italian border and I think uh, Herbert and his wife were very much left to their own devices so I have this image of him lying prone in his bed in the final months of his life in the the autumn I think it was a very very cold year and uh, he passed away on the 22nd of October 1916 as I say, there were a number of obituaries at the time, but I suspect that very soon after, he was quickly forgotten because um, people were more concerned with keeping themselves alive during what was a very, very difficult time. È molto importante la figura di Herbert perché eh, nelle sue scelte, le scelte di eh, lasciare eh, il conosciuto, no? la famiglia, la propria nazione, per seguire un, un sogno, un obiettivo, fa parte del nostro DNA, cioè il fatto che l'obiettivo, in questo caso non è più la, fonda, la nascita di una squadra, ma il raggiungimento del campionato, del, de, 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 della Champions o semplicemente anche eh, della vittoria della domenica, è frutto di, di cose che eh, Herbert ha applicato nel quotidiano. Cioè eh, grande concentrazione, grande passione e avere queste qualità nel imprinting, nel nel proprio DNA eh, è straordinario e riconoscerlo a chi chi è stato il primo a mettere la pietra di 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 questa storia eh, è molto importante perché il futuro non esiste se non conosci il tuo passato.
secondo me se sei appassionato è un piacere se non sei appassionato è giusto che voi mi facciate quelle domande lì di dire ma quanto tempo ci metti quanto ti costa quanto ti... per me è un piacere quando tu hai una cosa che ti piace e anzi sei tu che devi essere grato alla collezione perché ti ti, ti dà momenti di, eh, di, di gioia, di soddisfazione, di rilassatezza, di tutto quello che vuoi.